and uh, some new perspective for assistive uh, rehabilitation robotics. So the, I organized my presentation in uh, different parts. First, uh, first I will give some uh, introdu introduction on symbiosis, what I intend for symbiosis. And uh, I will speak about actions for robots and functions. So I will speak about robots and uh, their actions and their functions. Then the, I will introduce our work on the hand and brain and how we developed a prosthetic hand controlled by the brain, which is our research objective. And uh, I will also, if I will have time, I will also speak about rehabilitation and assistance. And uh, a few words about future perspectives, but I will open uh, field for discussion, for questions and comments, so I, I prefer that you make some uh, questions on what uh, I will introduce. So uh, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions, that will be informal, so you can raise your hand and ask the question. If you don't understand or you want I explain if I understand. <laughs> okay. And uh, so human robot symbiosis. Uh, what we want to do is to develop a hand and exoskeleton that will be controlled by the brain. So I will try to explain what I intend for controlled by the brain. And uh, our uh, research question is, is physical human exoskeleton symbiosis doable? So we started from hand, now we are studying also exoskeleton. So the final, the research question is that, so we, we would like to uh, exploit our experience in developing hand for developing exoskeleton controlled by the brain. So I want to uh, go more in depth in this issue, of what we intend for uh, symbiosis and for natural control. So in the 60s, in man-computer symbiosis, like leader, formulated a vision of human computer symbiosis. So you have to read that paper by Lick Leader if you didn't. And uh, it's important because you can uh, see the vision of what is the sharing the same goal uh, between the human and the, and the computer. So we would like to do the same, sharing the same goal between the uh, human being and the exoskeleton or the hand and the robot because only in that way we can execute exactly what the human being would like to do. So one of the, uh, one of the main reasons why uh, human subjects refuse to use uh, actual prosthetic hand, the ha prosthetic hands that are available on the market, is because the prosthetic hand is not doing what they want or what they expect to do. So physically, this, there is this problem of the relation between the robot and the human subject. If you are not operating by sharing the same objective of the human being and doing different from what the subject wants to do, uh, the subject will refuse the robot. Okay? So now we <coughs> can say that human and computer share goals, but we cannot say that human and robot share goals <coughs> in the same way. So uh, what we think that uh, uh, the, um, the requirements are for developing really usable robot uh, in symbiosis with the human being. First of all, wearability. This is uh, the most difficult issue. So this is related to design and biomechanics. So we need uh, a good mechanism and uh, is uh, a subject for, is a topic for uh, mechanical engineers to develop mechanisms that are really wearable for the user. But there are also uh, different issues like uh, energy consumption, uh, cosmetics, external uh, appearance and similar. So wearability is an issue. So there is now a field of robotics which, which is called wearable robot and a lot of people is working in that field because this is the first problem. So the first is related to the physical structure of the robot which must be coupled with the uh, 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 musculoskeletal structure of the human subject. So first of all wearability. Second, natural control. So this is uh, 
uh, not really uh, easy to be defined for an engineer, what we intend for natural control, because this means to enter in the, in the feeling and in the loop, uh, in the control loop of the human subject, communicating with the brain, communicating with the body, and being a part of the body. So we speak about body ownership. Now we are studying how to provide a better sense of ownership for robots external to the, to the human subject. When we implant a prosthetic hand, we are investigating if the subject is feeling the hand as part of his own body or her own body. So natural control is also an issue. That means that the burden for the subject to control the hand or the exoskeleton must be low, so the subject must feel good. So it is exactly when you use uh, a laptop and you are not uh, familiar with it and you don't feel that it's a natural control. You, you need a lot of skills or, or training and speaking with uh, computer scientists or with technicians in order to be able to feel the laptop as part of your own body. So. And then, <coughs> and also there is the, the issue that you want to do something and the laptop or the robot is not doing what you want to do. And that is frustrating and is really far from natural control. Because when you move your hand, you don't think because you have proprioception uh, that helps you in uh, moving your hand without thinking of what you are really doing and where you are pointing your hand or your fingers. So we, we want to uh, reach a good uh, a natural control in that sense, and that means that uh, you have to introduce proprioception in the robot. So the body <coughs> must know, understand where the robot is without uh, using vision and eyes, but using the uh, feeling, the, uh, the skin and the contact between the skin and the robot. So what is important in that field is that it's not important the skin of the robot, so the interaction between the robot in, and the environment. It's much more important the skin between the natural skin and the robot. So the, the interface between the human subject body and the robot body. So we are monitoring the interface between the robot and the human body. Safe interaction is related to natural control, of course. Safe interaction me means that we must monitor the interaction between the robot and the body, which is much uh, more important uh, uh, for safety, and also the safety of the robot by interacting with the environment, which is also important. It is important in prosthetic hand development because the hand uh, is in contact with the environment and if the subject doesn't feel the temperature or similar and the environment, the hand can be damaged by interacting in, uh, in, uh, in with, the, with the environment uh, in a wrong way. And then body ownership, which is an issue. I will uh, tell you something about that. This is. Uh, uh, new for robotics, not new for neuroscience, but we are trying to uh, collaborate with neuroscientists in order to develop this artificial body ownership uh, sense. So the first issue is uh, wearability. When I will speak about the hand, I will try to explain what we uh, mean for, is there a pointer uh, here? No, no, okay. So, but uh, I will move and uh, so wearability, For, uh, we started to develop artificial hands uh, in about uh, 10 years ago. Yeah, you stick this in your USB port and you can control your slides. Yes, I don't know if my robot will uh, it, stand to that. <laughs> okay. And um, so in order to develop a hand that, no, okay, I was sure about that. <laughs> No, 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 remove it. Uh, it's better if you remove it. Okay. Okay, I will do that. Go back. No, no, you, you got there we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the top button is the pointer and the two lateral buttons. Okay, very good. 
So this is the artificial hand. So the main objective for wearability is that all the mechanisms should be included in the shape of the hand. Okay? And that is really a very, it is a tough task for a mechanical and mechatronic engineers because you have to include motors that in the natural hand are outside in the forearm. So in the forearm we have the, the power for the hand force. In the prosthetic hand, all the power should come from the palm. So it's not bio-inspired, it's artificially inspired. It is like a satellite. You have to put everything inside and uh, uh, launch the satellite and then it must work without any additional power or control. So here it's a, a completely autonomous system which must be wireless connected to the user by means of the interface and must be autonomous from the point of view of energy consumption, of mechanism, of sensors and everything. So it's one of the reasons why the progress of artificial hands, of, of prosthetic hands is so slow, is that it's too difficult to develop a system that for uh, 12 hours must be independent and working all the day and uh, being able to provide enough energy to all the cycle of grasping that are required uh, in a day for activities of daily living. So you, here you can see the different grasps. So the, we have the kinematic system and also the mechanism which is uh, complicated. We have uh, published several papers also on the mechanism that are not really interesting for uh, interdisciplinary research because it's really a topic which is related to the development of an appropriate mechanism in order to distribute, to have a few motors which are located in uh, strange positions inside the palm because you have the constraints, the total constraints of the shape of the hand and you have to transmit the power to the fingers without uh, having too much friction and uh, problems and uh, low efficiency, so it's very complicated. And here the patent uh, challenge is to make a mechanism and patent it and sell uh, the mechanism to all the producers of hands. Okay, so this is uh, one of the main uh, points for developing wearability. So this is the internal glove, then you have an external glove which is uh, soft and it's the, is the cosmetic glove. So the <coughs> human robot symbiosis. So the second point is symbiosis. Uh, we will see that in developing exoskeleton. So the first point is wearability, safe and comfortable physical human robot interaction. This requires a lot of biomechanics. Even for the simplest joint in the human arm here, the elbow, it's very difficult to develop a mechanism which is able to follow the rotation of the joint axis and being able to uh, follow the movement without harming it. So we have one degree of freedom, active degree of freedom for the elbow, but we have four passive degrees of freedom in order to take into account the different movement that the axis, the rotation axis is doing during the normal flexion extension movement of the elbow. So we will see the, our system, which is one of the systems that we, uh, was designed in order to let the user during his movement feel free of moving in uh, the working space. The second point is natural control. So we need a non-invasive, we are strictly non-invasive. So we don't want to implant interface in the brain. We want to use the natural signal and to provide the natural control without uh, implanting systems for the moment in the body or in the brain. So, <coughs> and, uh, so we want non-invasive user motion intention detection. So the intention detection is very difficult because it is related to the natural control, to the burden for the user to use uh, the, the system. And so we must... Um, <coughs> Uh, exchange information without requiring too much attention and uh, the information must be the, the, the very, very simple and the control for controlling the axis and then the system must be independently adapting to the human movement. So, and uh, I will speak about how we are using adaptive oscillators that were developed for central pattern generator 
For, uh, for lower limb locomotion, we are using the same oscillators in order to exchange information about rhythmic movements between the uh, human arm and the axis. Third, the safe interaction, which is one, uh, one issue which is important. Uh, we developed a, a skin which is based on our sensors which were de previously de developed for the hand and we are now developing an internal skin which is at the interface between the exoskeleton and the lower limb and we are using with different uh, uh, commercial uh, exoskeletons and also prototypes of systems around Europe in order to make this monitoring of the movements during locomotion which is an additional information and prevent uh, arming to harm to the lower limb. So, <laughs> the, 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 thir the third point was related to uh, body ownership, which means we are uh, uh, replacing the natural limb with the artificial limb and arm, and we want that the subject feel the artificial hand as the natural hand. This is a very difficult task. And we make a parallelism between the control system and the brain and uh, the brain is in the loop of the control system, so we have an autonomous control system on board in the PAL, and also in the loop of the control system with different layers, we have the brain, giving the <coughs> eye order um, commands, and the eye level commands to the system. And then the muscles and the actuation system, so in the natural uh, hand, uh, the muscles are in the forearm, here in the system, all the muscles must be here and reduced in the hand. Then the tendons, which are uh, in the similar to the transmission system, and uh, the skeleton, which are the link and the joints in the hand, and the mechanoreceptors, and in particular, we studied the mechanoreceptors with neurophysiologists of the skin and trying to replicate some major uh, characteristics of the human skin in order to provide a, a system which is bio-inspired in that case for controlling grasping. So the body ownership is an uh, issue. You can see, uh, you can read this paper by uh, these uh, colleagues. They developing, uh, they uh, published several papers on this uh, particular uh, <coughs> effect uh, which is related to a rubber hand which is cosmetic so it's, uh, it's similar to the natural hand so the subject uh, this is the real hand of the subject this is the rubber hand so the subject is uh, looking at the rubber hand <coughs> and uh, so after <coughs> some while it, when you uh, obtain and achieve and reach this body ownership effect you can uh, touch the rubber hand and the subject is feeling uh, uh, as you are touching his real hand, but you are touching the rubber hand and not the real hand. So uh, neurophysiologists are interested in developing and studying if it is only related to the visual, visual vision and, uh, or is also related to the sensory motor area areas which are involved in the, in the process. That uh, could, be, could mean that uh, you are really in the loop of the sensory motor areas. And we uh, developed a simple system based on uh, electroencephalography because we would like to make experiments o on uh, our artificial hands. And so we are investigating how far we can provide uh, uh, this uh, body ownership sense. So uh, here you have this website, you can go and see uh, a video of our system. I don't know if it works. I don't know how much time, just a moment. We can try if it works. No. Where? Okay. 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 Okay.
nunca bebes café. Y tú no puedes despertarte sin uno. Ciudad. Naturaleza. Atrevido. No tanto. I don't know why there is this just now. <laughs> Okay, this was the video. So you can see here how you are brushing the two hands and the subject is only looking at the rubber hand and uh, moment by moment is uh, developing this sense of body ownership. Okay. So qui, here they uh, can also feel stabbing the hand, rubber hand as they are stabbing the natural hand. Okay. So, <coughs> it's not working anymore. Okay, so <coughs> uh, going back to the content of my lecture, uh, the next step after wearability, safety and uh, body ownership, we can go to actions and functions. First of all, the actions. If you make a sort of segmentation of all the functions that you have uh, in activities of daily living, so our objective is to go on activities of daily living, which means uh, nutrition, uh, personal hygiene, going to the bathroom, uh, washing the, uh, and, and, and similar. And uh, if you go to uh, all uh, these actions uh, concerning the upper limb, you find that you can segment in reaching, which means reaching the space, the object of your uh, grasping, what you want to grasp, touching. So think about uh, going to the glass of water. So first of all, you reach it. Then when you reach it, you have to touch it. So and uh, the control uh, system is, com is changing when you touch it. When you are in contact with the object and you feel that the object is in your hand, is safely in contact with your hand, you start to move from shape and the position control to force control. So during reaching, the problem is to pre-shape the hand, open the hand exactly in the <coughs> right way. Then you go to the uh, glass, and when, when you touch it, you start to change from position control to force control. So you, do, you don't see where you are touching it, but you are only feeling, and you are relying on your skin mechanoreceptors and your memory of the same events when you were uh, developing your grasping and manipulation ability. So it's important to have a good position control during the reaching phase, but when you are in the grasping phase, you have to rely on good sensors to detect the contact between the system and the object that you are manipulating and uh, the uh, robot skin, because it's the robot skin that is in contact with the system, and you have to control the system by using the events that is detecting the sensory parts of your hand. Then you grasp and you make the force control. So you are modulating force and uh, you feel if you are good in providing to the system with uh, the interface, so to the human subject, the sense of body ownership and also the sense of the uh, environment which is related to exteroception. So the feeling and then we, you can go to manipulating which is moving in your hand and for the moment manipulating is still a dream. So you are not, we are not speaking about manipulating because we are not able to manipulate. So we are in the, uh, uh, still in the reaching, touching, grasping and feeling and now we are investigating on feeling, how to provide to the subject the feeling of what the pro mechanical properties of the objects, the position of the object and similar, but not about manipulating, which is still far to be 
reached by our systems. And then when you are able to, go to <coughs> provide this, uh, this kind of, uh, these this actions, uh, you can go to functions. Functions are related to what the user wants to do, uh, which means loco locomotion, navigation, and manipulation, for example, or activities of daily living, or uh, tapping on the computer, or uh, opening uh, a window, or similar. And then you can speak about therapy and about motor recovery, which is uh, a, a step uh, forward. So uh, functional replacement in terms of providing a good control of artificial hand is one step. The second step is to provide motion, motion, motor uh, recovery and motor learning for the user to improve the control system and to be able to do more and more and go far and far in uh, restoring functions in the user. And uh, so the, we speak about replacement when we speak about prosthetics. So which means that the hand is lost and we have to replace with a new hand. Or we speak about enhancement when we speak about personal assistance, which means that we must make uh, the functional assessment of the available functions and then we try to provide a sort of enhancement of the functions. So these are reaching, grasping, touching, manipulating. So the, the reaching task is typical is the is reaching the object, uh, and this is grasping. Grasping is related to the kinematic uh, structure of the hand, which means which kind of grasp and different uh, hand uh, and fingers position you can reach in the space. If you are good in uh, doing and in uh, developing a good structure in your hand, you are able to do cylindrical grasp or um, grasping the, uh, lateral grasp or pinch grasp or lateral grasp, for example, for credit card, you need this lateral grasp, okay? So if you are not able to provide this grasp, and in many commercial hands, this kind of grasp is not available, the user will <coughs> never be able to grasp a credit card or a CD in, uh, in, uh, for the computer. So, and then we are studying uh, this movement, which is the pick and lift, uh, which is a standard movement in neurophysiology, which has been used for developing knowledge about the human skin mechanoreceptors. And we are trying to use the same task in order to make a parallelism between uh, what we are able to do with artificial hands and what natural hands are able to do. So, <coughs> touching and grasping. touching and grasping, uh, you can see here, for example, in a grasping task, you, can, you have to rely on sensors that are on board and in order to monitor the contact and the force that is developed. So these are the typical uh, grasping tasks. So for functional replacement, what we intend is that the hand must be worn by the user and must go with the user and you cannot do anything. So you develop the system, you provide the system to the user and the user is using it and you are, not, uh, you are responsible for its use. And it's totally different from giving a therapy in a, in a place where you can control the exoskeleton for providing a therapy or you are in a hospital or in an environment which is controlled. For artificial hands, the main uh, difficult uh, task is that you have to provide energy, you have to provide a system that must be robust and reliable. This is the reason why the technology on board on commercial prosthetic hands is so simple, because it must be reliable. Can you talk a bit about, a little about the perception of weight? Yes, I have some slides on that. Okay. Yes. I, I have one other question. The allometry of the fingers and the thumbs seem Yes. And the fingers are different lengths. I mean, these hands really seem to be the same length. And the thumb here looks really disproportionate. Yes. Is there, is there a reason for that? No, it's no. It's a prototype that we tested three years ago in human subjects. And we were interested in testing the interface in that case. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay? And uh, because the main reason 
for making this kind of test is related if we add some degrees of freedom in the prototype, which means different grasp, we, will we be able to control all those degrees of freedom without uh, making too much burden for the user? So we were interested in seeing if the user uh, felt uh, comfortable with our system and uh, having some ideas of uh, uh, the possibility of controlling different degrees of freedom at the same time. So I will show you. So our work is uh, going in parallel. If we don't demonstrate that we are able to control different degrees of freedom and the system which is much more complex, it's not worth to go to a complex technology to develop a cosmetic hand. Okay, mm -hmm. so we are going in parallel. We are developing a new hand. This is a hand which is uh, from about uh, four years old. Now we have the new one, I will show. But thi this is to show which kind of experiments and, uh, we are doing for the yeah. moment, okay? Well, I, I'm just wondering, is, is the proportionate length of the different parts yes. important? Uh, okay, for the thumb, uh, we need an additional motor. So the problem in the, the system that we are developing now, the motor is included in the palm because you need the motor for flexion, extension, okay? And then you need an additional mo a motor to rotate the axis to provide the thumb opposition. So in the natural thumb, you have five degrees of freedom, mm -hmm. five here. And some motors in the, in the forearm and some <coughs> muscles here internal to the hand for stabilizing the, the movement. And so you have five in nature. So we are trying to see if we are able to provide similar movement, so what the movement that we need with only two degrees of freedom. One for extension and flexion and one for moving the palm. Mm -hmm. So mainly in our field, the, the challenge is to introduce here this additional motor and to put it in the, in the palm. I will show you some something on that. So this is an example of rehabilitation that we will see later, but uh, it's a totally different system. And here you can see the, the problem of the mechanism and uh, the transmission of intention between the user and uh, the axis. So I will go to the hand. When I have to stop, you stop me, okay? <laughs> okay. So the <coughs> basic functionalities are reaching and pre-shaping, grasping, manipulation with a stable grasp, gesture expression, and exploration. So for the moment, we are doing some research in reaching and pre-shaping, which is much mostly related to the interface. Grasping, which is related to the mechanism and the ability of providing all mechanism with a cosmetic hand. And uh, we are far, far to obtain manipulation with a stable grasp. And we do some gesture expression and some exploration with a single finger. So we are doing some research on exploration uh, strategies for the single finger, the natural finger and the artificial finger. So the idea is that uh, we need to stand alone prosthetic hand, which must be autonomous with some sensors on board and we have to provide also uh, feedback, sensory feedback to the user. So the task is to have a brain controlled hand. And uh, so the main problems are related to the mechanism and also to the problem of encoding and providing feedback to the, to the user. So how to encode the information that are gathered by the end sensors to the brain, which information should we provide to the subject and uh, uh, which kind of encoding system we have to provide. And then there is the problem of decoding the user intention, so to find an appropriate uh, interface and decode the intention from the interface and control the hand. So the system, the, the uh, area is divided in different parts. So the, there is work on the, on the hand, so on sensors, mechanism, power, actuation and control, and work on the interface, which is also important, is important as much as the hand. So, and so we, we know that this is a loop, 
So, and uh, the, these two systems are not independent because the requirements for the mechatronic system are set by the interface performance. Because if you have few channels, two or three channels, and the bandwidth is too narrow, you cannot exchange information. So you, it's not worth to include uh, complex mechanism in the hand. On the other hand, we know that interfaces can be effectively evaluated only with smart device. So we know that we are, if we go far in developing interface, we need uh, a good mechanism in order to assess the interface that we provide. So we have to uh, make several behavioral studies so what we learned basically from uh, uh, natural scientists, neurophysiologists, is how to perform behavioral studies. This is a skill that engineers are not able to uh, develop during their studies. So they have to learn how to study the human being in the loop with the body, with the robot, and uh, to make behavioral studies. Because for us it's simple to open the system and look what it, it is not working. But we cannot open the human brain or the human body. And we must learn how to develop behavioral studies and understand and assess our system in use with the subject. And this is an interesting skill that we, we can uh, learn from neurophysiology and user assessment and also vocational therapy and activities of daily living. So we have three parts, <coughs> the robotic hand, the interface and the sense of body ownership. So we can go, this is the, the point. So for, the what, for what concerns the uh, bio-inspired tactile system? It depends on the level that you want to, to go. So the, for the first level, for the first skill ability, for the skill, first skill that you want to develop in the system, you need a simple uh, event detection. Uh, first, contact release on the fingertip and object, which, and uh, then contact information on the object environment, and slippage information on the fingertip object. So this is a very basic, this is very simple to tell you, but uh, we uh, spend a, spent a lot of time with neurophysiology, with neurophysiologists and neurophysiology studies in <coughs> order to understand that for the first level, grasping an object like uh, um, uh, the pick and lift uh, task for a glass of water, we need only this information. And we also wrote several papers on that, on that in collaboration with Benedim from Umeå University by, uh, for demonstrating that we don't need a complex tactile system, but only a system which is able to provide the timing for contact release on the fingertip and object. And so in my, to my opinion, this is the really this is really bio-inspired design, which means that it, it is based on the studies on the natural mechanoreceptors in the skin that are providing, according to the Edin and Johansson studies, the event detection which are providing to the human being the ability of making the pick and lift task. So what's the contact information on the object? Is that pressure? Uh, no, contact information is that when you are controlling the hand, so you are going uh, in position control. So then you go to the position and you must know which kind of uh, opening you have to provide. When you contact the, the, the system, so you are in contact and then you close your hand. When you are in contact, so you have a, a sort of mechanoreceptor system that is giving you the information that you are touching the system. When you touch it, you have to move from position control to force control because hopefully you are in the appropriate position and you start <coughs> to control the force and to increase the force, uh, not moving the, the fingers. So the fingers uh, are moved because you are applying force and you are applying force and according to your experience, you have to apply the appropriate force. So you need the information of only the contact between the fingers and the, and the object. So I understood the initial point of contact first. The so initial the point of contact. But then after that, the information about the force, wasn't that just the yes. pressure? Yes, the, this pressure. Okay. 
is not really pressure. We are not using pressure, we are using the tendon information, which is the force on the transmission, which is much more bio-inspired. Yes, because pressure, pressure is related to the shape of the object, okay? Is the sort of tactile image of the object on the fingers, but you don't need that when you grasp an object. You need only to see how much force you are applying. So you are controlling the force by, and uh, putting the system in the appropriate force according to the property of the object. Yeah, it's not one Sorry? I mean one one component, very simple. If you, uh, only one component, only force on the tendons, or power in the force on the tendons, which are the transmission. Tendon. So uh, <coughs> when you have this contact information, you need the, the force on the tendon, okay, the, the transmission cable, and then you modulate the force in order to provide force control, and then you need some slippage information, but this is an order of, uh, I don't know how to say, of magnitude, uh, of complexity, much, uh, uh, it, it's, <coughs> it's not easy to provide <coughs> slippage information because this requires a fast reaction of the user. So in the hand control, in the actual hand control, when you are, must be in the loop, you only provide force control. You set the force in order not to make the object slipping because if the object, object starts to slip, you are uh, lost. Too much force, what would happen then, you'd lose the force feedback Sorry? If you did too much force and started crushing the you, you, take, you, put the, you have to make experience before, so you, say you, you calibrate the system, so you have level of, uh, of force, so you know which level uh, is safe, so you don't apply too much force because you, make a, you put a, tr a threshold in the force, so you limit the, the threshold by means putting some thresholds, but so you know that there is a safe uh, range of force and you are apply you are applying this range of force <coughs> and you provide, if you want, if you, you, if you are able to provide that, you provide some uh, uh, force feedback by means of tactors on the skin, if you want, because the subject doesn't know how much force is applying. <coughs> Sometimes you can, uh, uh, there is a sort of drawback of, of uh, present motors, so the user is uh, hearing the sound of motors and so understand the level of force by hearing the sound of motors, but this is not good because we, have, we, we need silent hands. So you have to provide force feedback with a different system, not by putting some noise in the system and using it, but some good uh, uh, users are able to understand from the noise, the level of noise that the motor is applying force. <coughs> so, and we are also studying, uh, developing a system to monitor uh, current consumption in the motor because the power consumption is much better than force measurement. It's the best because you know, if you know uh, the efficiency of the system, you know how much force you are applying. So, <coughs> and then there is the second level for manipulating. You need more. You need the local object shape on the, on the fingertip. So the tactile image of the system, because you know to understand in which position is the object in uh, your reference frame in the hand. So it's much more complex. And in the third level of manipulation, you, you also need local information on shear <coughs> and normal forces. So you, we try to define these level, levels of complexity and the sensory system changes according to the level of complexity that we want in the hand. This is an overview of the mechanism and uh, it's, I don't want to enter on it <coughs> and uh, about sensors and the distribution of sensors and which kind of sensor we, we are using, joint sensors, cable tension sensors and touch pressors pressure sensors and similar. And this is the, the system which is uh, one of the most important characteristic of the system is power management. 
So it's related to the power consumption in the system, like in cellular phone, in mobile phones, okay? And this is a spin-off company of my uh, Pozoc, and uh, they are selling the hand. So this is the, the uh, present version of the hand. So this is a hand that we sent uh, to China, and we are making experiments in different labs with different interfaces by doing different behavior experiments uh, in different uh, places in the world. So we can sound the hand and make some, um, and we can also make collaboration with different groups uh, interested in uh, investigating on interfaces. Are there any cyborg users with hands right now? Uh, the humanoid robot, no. no, uh, no humans, humans. Humans, yes, yes. Okay. Subjects in the lab, not in at all, lab. yes. Yes, uh, subjects in the labs and also monkeys in the neuroscience laboratories. Okay. There are several cases. Of Se some cases that are uh, that doing experiments. Or for the time of, uh, Our hand for the moment is not implanted in subject, it's not commercial. Okay. okay. Uh, so this is the kind of research that we are doing. So we are using this hand mostly for research on interfaces and we developed a different system. Different systems and uh, for example based on uh, electromyographic dextrose control in order to understand how many different finger postures we can control by uh, combining uh, learning of the interface by means of uh, 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 virtual reality globe, which means that uh, the user is telling to the system we from uh, for uh, combining the uh, contractions of its residual muscles in the forearm and the uh, uh, desired movement of the fingers and the system, uh, the interface is learning and then is applying the <coughs> the uh, command. Uh, these are some of the experiments that we are doing in Lund because this is a collaboration with Lund University in uh, Sweden and this is a user who is uh, using the hand. This is an example of the kind of experiments that we are doing. So I intend, uh, uh, these are behavioral experiments which means that user is training the hand and then is using the hand in uh, doing uh, some task and then we um, make a sort of assessment of our system in order to provide uh, feedback for the design for designing uh, better hands. So what kind of information do you get from the, from the other hand? That okay, in that case it's very simple. Here we have uh, a number of electrodes on the stump, okay? And uh, there is uh, an interface we based on neural network system on motor learning, which is uh, uh, connecting the uh, contraction of the mu residual muscles in the stump to the desired grasp. So the user is assigning for to each movement of to each grasp of the natural hand some contraction of the muscles and uh, he is in charge of selecting which kind of grasp and which kind of contraction. So what we want to develop is a general system which is uh, uh, adaptive to the user. So the user is selecting the level and the complexity of the different grasp and if uh, he feels that it feels good in uh, controlling three or four movements and what we want to do in to see is to see how far we can go, how many movements. For example, we have eight channel CMG classifier which is difficult for the user because you have eight different contractions. So we, can in, we want to investigate how far we can go and uh, we want also to investigate the burden for the user in controlling it in the activities. Uh, Just so I understand it. So they are trying to do asymmetric movements there? The, the, the no, one hand on the data glove, right? In the, in the data glove they are only telling to the interface which kind of grasp they mm -hmm. want to do. 
So you have to, th uh, to think about very simple so graphs. Like yes, yes. It, and you want to, it's not complex, which means complex movement, mm -hmm. but very simple graphs. So, and we are doing this kind of, this, uh, this is an example uh, uh, of results that we obtain from this data, from these experiments, which are related to the success rate. So what we want to achieve is the highest possible success rate, which means 90% of the grasp are performed in a correct way. So the user in 90% of the cases is satisfied that the hand is doing what the user wants to do. <coughs> so for the moment, <coughs> we are able to reach the 80%, which is not good, because this means that in 20% of the case, the, the, cases, uh, the hand is not doing what the subject want to do, wants to do. So this is another example, also bio-inspired, because we studied the paper by Santello and Flanders, which demonstrated that control of the hand posture involves few postural synergies. So Santello is studying synergies between, uh, among different muscles and try to simplify the control of the different grasp by identifying some uh, uh, synergies that are used <coughs> in uh, different grasp. And the Santello and Flanders, they are using PCA and we use the similar, similar approach, exactly the same. We apply the same method which means that we have two channels, uh, uh, EMG acquisition module, and we uh, uh, do this acquisition of EMG, and we make, made this PCA-based control algorithm, and we found uh, six position synergies, which means that we have a sort of uh, planar control corresponding to two signals, two contractions, that are modulated in the space, <coughs> and uh, we assigned to <coughs> those two uh, signals different movement of the hands by, by finding three different synergies which are related to the lateral grasp, to the tripod, tripod grasp and to the palmar grasp. <coughs> So uh, we want to, to test this and we test it with different subjects. So you can see here you have different subjects and we found that for what concerns power control we are able to reach a good uh, success and in precision, uh, precision uh, grasp we are not uh, good especially for some uh, subjects <coughs> and for lateral grasp we are good. So we are good in discriminating power to lateral and we are good in, in providing this control of power and lateral grasp. What sort of reliability do you need for the um, patients to not get frustrated? <laughs> yes, this is the risk. So we are doing experiments on that. Uh, So we are doing uh, these experiments with several subjects now and uh, uh, not in our laboratory, but in a different laboratory because we want to be independent. So uh, the colleagues from the University of Pavia, they are doing that. And I know that some subjects are really frustrated. They don't want to continue. So it depends on the subject. Uh, some individuals can take benefits. So what? Uh, I think is that the uh, interface, we, we must develop a system which must be adapted to the, to the user. Because the user is, is using the hand for the rest of his life or her life. So you can provide a system and spend a week in training the system and try to configure the interface according to the user. That is not possible for the moment because the system, the commercial hands are very closed. But we must change and go to individual uh, interface. So you have the same hardware, but you can adapt the interface as, as you adapt your uh, uh, system of the, of, the, of the laptop or similar to your uh, abilities and your, uh, your skill. So, and for us it's important to go on that and to understand that if those synergies 
are really good because if you, we go to synergies, we can combine movements and try to find simple synergies in order to control different uh, uh, hand postures and go uh, to from uh, this position which is totally open to totally closed by only with two signals. This is uh, powerful in, in theory. <laughs> so <coughs> and we are doing similar uh, in a different uh, laboratory so we, we are doing all uh, this research in collaborations with colleagues around the world and here is, for, uh, with, is with, with the Alborg University and uh, here we are using vision. So because <coughs> this is the problem, uh, this is one of the one of the problem for the subject to control the hand is that the subject must uh, provide uh, eye level uh, commands to the hand. So to select the grasp type and to select the grasp size. So for reaching, this is for reaching. For reaching you have to select uh, and to understand the properties of the object and then define the uh, opening of the hand and the shaping of the hand according to the properties of the object. That can be done, uh, that can be done, uh, the, the user is able to do that but is not able to communicate that to the hand. Okay? So if we want uh, to communicate that to the hand, the hand can do that itself. So with this system, with the hand system, by putting a sort of camera in the hand. So the hand can recognize the system, the, for example, the property of the object. This is a glass of water and select, uh, it can select <coughs> the, the grasp sites and uh, the kind of the, the pre-shaping and we did that with a simple system developed in the Oldborg uh, University and we uh, uh, were able to achieve 84% <coughs> of correct type and sites uh, uh, assignment with, and also the time to accomplish the task were decreasing uh, across the trials which means that the system is, is uh, doing well. So uh, instead of uh, giving the, to the subject the burden of uh, identifying the property of the object and giving the commands to the hand, uh, it's better to rely on the hand system uh, which is developing this skill and so the, if it is done in, uh, independently, independently the, the subject is uh, uh, happier. So in that case we found that uh, the subjects were uh, uh, satisfied <coughs> by that system. So for what concern sensory feedback? This is another issue. I don't know how much time uh, I have left? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. So for non-invasive sensory feedback device, <coughs> uh, which is the, the, to close the loop and provide some feedback which is really useful. First of all, we must understand which kind of feedback we have to provide to the subject. And uh, we, <coughs> made, uh, we studied the state of the art. Uh, electrocutaneous uh, stimulation of uh, vibrotactile and tactile and we decided to develop a new device for stimulation and so for the moment we are still investigating uh, on, the, on the stimulation system and we developed a small uh, what we call Vibel uh, which is composed of three motors and the combination of, three of these three motors is uh, good in providing si uh, signals with different intensity, amplitude and also frequency pattern. And we made experiments for the moment with subjects uh, with different vibration amplitudes and different vibration frequency and also to site stimulation. And also we made uh, behavioral experiments with uh, users in order to understand uh, how far we can go in uh, discriminating different uh, signals, okay? And uh, we have uh, now published a paper which is, uh, will be published in a short time on that. So because we, we need uh, to provide to the user a feedback of the force, of the contact and all uh, the, the feedback that is necessary to provide to the user. And uh, this is uh, the work that we did uh, only recently, a uh, few months ago. 
and this it is related to the hand posture which means uh, one of the difficulties in uh, controlling the hand is that the contraction of muscles is changing according to the position of the hand in the space so this is really a problem in trying to export all this research in a real hand so we did a lot of work uh, in trying to understand uh, how, uh, how far we can go in combining the uh, information about the uh, dynamic movements and the dynamic condition of the arm and the contraction of muscles in order to make uh, <coughs> a sort of uh, combination and to give to the interface the information about uh, the real intention of the user. So you were sp speaking about the weight of the hand. Uh, you, she was. Sure. Uh, you asked me about the weight of the hand. So we are doing experiment exactly on that. So we have to investigate uh, and uh, to put some sensors because the weight of the hand is affecting the uh, muscle condition of the subject and this is new and it is preventing the uh, use of ENG control in uh, commercial hands. Does this user perceive the prosthetic as heavy? Yes, they perceive it and, uh, as, very they heavy. as very heavy and uh, because uh, it depends on the time after amputation that you implant the hand. So you are, if they are not used to have the hand anymore and you put the hand, even, the if, even if the weight of the hand is similar to the weight of the natural hand, the condition of the muscles is changing because they are contracting muscles, so the EMG that is detected is depends on the position of the hand. I if you are in that position, in neutral position, or in this position, and when you move the hand in the space, there are a lot of false, uh, fake uh, uh, control uh, commands because you are moving the muscles not because you want to open the hand but because you want to uh, compensate for the inertia of the hand which is moving in the space. So we are doing a lot of research on that because one of the results of our experiments with human subjects is that there is this problem that uh, there is the variation of the weight of the prosthesis when they grasp an object, so the uh, total weight is increasing, and also the movements of the arm, which is giving uh, additional uh, inertia to the system. So we are doing a lot of experiments on that, so I cannot go in detail on that, on detail on that. But what I, I go to the conclusion, because we made, made several experiments in for investigating on movement effects and uh, we sorry uh, even if the subjects were uh, uh, trained and uh, we, we found that uh, the, the movements are affecting the EMG pattern so what we want to say which is important is that uh, what we need is uh, excuse me try to go where I want to go. Okay, so what we need is uh, an interface which is, which includes the EMG electrodes plus uh, <coughs> the vibels to stimulate plus some inertial sensors to detect the dynamic movement of the hand. So the good interface, according to our, our experience, must include not only uh, the EMG control or, and uh, the uh, feedback uh, stimulators, but also the measurement of the position in the space to provide the body ownership with the stimulation system and also the inertial properties, which means the acceleration of the upper limb, the weight and everything and we want to put that and to provide the stimulation with our vibels which is uh, 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 related to the all the global condition of the arm in the space. So this was the... I have a question. Uh, so you're using uh, vibration as... 
Yeah. Yeah. Skill sets, right? yeah. Doing different frequencies. How is that bad? Like, what? How do you determine which frequency to use? Maybe we. You uh, okay. Now we are um, uh, developing a system which can be included in the interface, which means that we are working on the Vibels and we found uh, uh, which kind of frequencies the subject can uh, discriminate and which kind of amplitudes. So, okay. so, so you haven't done the mapping yet? Really? No, the mapping is next step. Uh, if we go to our... Uh, just a moment, and we, we have... Uh, Some data we have already, some we have to develop. Okay. These are some data that we already have. And we found, uh, we developed a system which, is, which can be incorporated in the socket. So the idea is to have a socket with EMG electrodes, uh, some uh, accelerometers to detect the dynamic condition of the uh, limb, and uh, some uh, vibels, which are providing feedback to the user by stimulating, with, uh, var uh, by uh, uh, modulating the frequency or the amplitude of stimulation. So what we know is that uh, we and the three amplitudes uh, that we selected uh, with our three motors were uh, discriminated by all subjects. So we saw that uh, the discrimination of amplitude is not, uh, uh, is, is not depending on the uh, activation frequency. And the, the second experiment, so here we, we were going to discrimination uh, uh, ability for amplitude across uh, different frequencies. And then we, were, we wanted to discriminate between different frequencies and we understood that uh, the amplitude of the, of the comparison must be lower than the standard stimulation. So they, we have to decrease also the amplitude to, to emphasize the ability of discriminating in frequency. And also we were interested in understanding the distance for the vibes. So we are doing... Uh, uh, these kind of behavioral studies, because if we don't understand exactly what the subjects are able to uh, detect, uh, it is not worth to but, but put. But you haven't thought about this box you want to map? Uh, yes. Mm, we know some, some uh, kind of tasks that we want to map. So, for example, we want to map contact. The contact information we want to map. And also we made experiments and we know that we want to map the force by, uh, with the frequency. So we found in our experiments that uh, uh, the subjects are good in uh, combining frequency of stimulation with force. Which means that you can increase the, the frequency and they uh, will use that information to understand how much force they are applying. Uh, it depends on the, um, on the objective that you have, because if uh, for discriminating free grasp, which means uh, cylindrical, lateral, yeah, and uh, uh, precision grasp, you need to uh, give a sort of feedback which is proportional to the force that you are applying and different for the free grasp. So the I think uh, uh, my time is over. Pretty much, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, if you have some additional questions, I can uh, answer. Uh, I tried to explain the experiments that we are doing instead of going in or to be too much general, to give an idea of which kind of research we are doing. The, um, 
Yes, okay. I, c I leave my, l the slides on the... Okay. This is, uh, this was the next part, but this is the, okay. Okay, well thank you. Yes. Uh, the delay is the major issue, which means that uh, we decided in, in the system that we are using with the users, so the real system, not in a research system. So the system that we are investigating, uh, uh, we try to uh, make uh, the force control, so they include the force control in the autonomous system of the hand, not including the subject in the loop. Because for the moment we are, the interface is the bottleneck and we are not able to uh, give the stimulation, includes the reaction of the user and then send the intention of the user to the, to the hand. So for the moment, uh, it's uh, the interface that is providing, uh, preventing us to go and uh, see if we are able uh, to study the, the, the lag in the, in the conscious system. Because even if the hand control is very fast, because we have a microcontroller inside and the sensors are good and very simple and robust, uh, the bottleneck is to provide the stimulation to the user and then to provide the command from the user. So it's almost impossible. It's related to the slippage. The slippage is occurring in uh, 150 milliseconds. So if it's impossible for the moment with the uh, uh, available interface to, to be able to react in less than 100 milliseconds. So from neurophysiology study, we know that the reaction of mechanoreceptors and the firing of mechanoreceptors is providing uh, to the brain uh, the, the feedback <coughs> in uh, f mm, about 100 milliseconds, which is far from what we can achieve in, in the bandwidth of the interface. So it's in the loop, so it's bio-inspired because we, say we, we use uh, the same segmentation of the neurophysiological system, which means uh, uh, event detection and uh, recon recognition of the slippage and then reaction, but we don't communicate it to the user. Yeah. No, no, with this kind of uh, interface, so the interface which we are using with the EMG system, <coughs> there is no delay for the user. This is not the problem. The, no, the problem is not uh, the delay in providing the command, the high level command. The problem is related to the failure. So the hand the system, the interface, does not understand the intention of the user and is doing differently from the, what the user wants. So <coughs> th this is the reason why we are making all these experiments with the percentage of success. So this is the benchmarking. When you reach 90%, we are sure that uh, okay, the user can be satisfied. But uh, the user is doing uh, the social life and system, so if uh, the user wants to grasp the, uh, the, um, the glass and the hand is still open and is not executing exactly what the user wants, the user will throw away the hand, for sure. It depends on the interface. <coughs> so, for the um, synergy system is based also on the intensity because you are modulating in the space so we are making a sort of uh, uh, trackpad which means uh, planar space where you move and you move the hand in the planar space trying to find the synergy between the movement of the fingers 
and the EMG signals, which means the, the, the PCA is used to modulate the intensity, so the XY system, which are two channels, the intensity of the two channels, and the movement of the fingers in the space. So you have six uh, movements, six flexion and extension, and you uh, uh, project these six movements in a 2D space in the plane. Because, uh, I mean, there's, for doing the con continuous motion, there's two ways, say with, with on and off, you could do the duration that you've got it on for, you know, yeah. you could go like that, and that might be easier to detect because of the classification. Yeah. Yes, so the, the, the first step is classifier. So we classify the system with the threshold and that is very simple. It's not reliable so much when you go to different electrodes because of the reason that I told you that is preventing the inertial characteristics and the dynamic of the movement which is affecting the muscle contraction. So nobody is telling you that when uh, they speak about the EMG interface, but in the, when you make the experiments, you easily find that uh, according to the position, the firing is totally different, the contraction. So you cannot use this on-off system in a simple way. You have to monitor exactly the acceleration plus uh, uh, the weight. So you have all the, in the, uh, motion equation, you have to put the uh, acceleration that also the weight of the, of the load that you have in the hand and the force that you have to, for uh, balancing this uh, inertia is provided by the muscles that are activated. Could you use another muscle rather than one on the arm to sort of stick one on the neck? <coughs> yes, the there is people that is using that. For example, the targeted reinnervation system, which is uh, developed by Kaiken in uh, Chicago, is using the muscles on the deltoid, okay? So they are simply moving the, uh, mm, the nervous fibers and uh, reinnervating the muscles that are good in the here, in, in that position, the deltoid and other muscles. And so they are using the contraction, these contractions. Uh, they are using that for this target rain innervation. Uh, they are using that for people with uh, um, uh, proximal uh, amputation, which means that uh, uh, they cannot use the residual muscles anymore. You know, Kaiken, you have to look at that. Sorry? Is it Northwestern? Yes, Northwestern, so, okay. Uh, uh, are there any other alternatives being looked at for controlling uh, the arm other than EMG from the emergency engine? We are, uh, we are doing also research on different uh, interface. You mean uh, which kind of signals? Yes. Uh, we are also doing research with peripheral nervous system interface electrodes and we made uh, an experiment by implanting our hand in combination with the electrodes implanted in the brachial nerve. And uh, these are electrodes, micro electrodes implanted in the peripheral nervous system and they are based on uh, micro electro machining. And uh, we used in particular the T-Life electrodes developed by Aalborg University and uh, Senting Ber Fraunhofer in Germany. And these are the s small electrodes implanted in the peripheral nervous system. And uh, in this kind of systems, you have the problem of uh, decoding the intention because you have the signals from uh, efferent uh, fibers, efferent and afferent fibers. So you have to decode the spikes of the uh, that you detect on the electrodes and try to reconstruct uh, the intention of the user. So we made experiments on that. And uh, the, uh, the peripheral nervous system interface have the advantage that in principle you can also stimulate. Because in the peripheral nervous system you can pr uh, provide the two uh, channels which is not uh, available with the cortical interface. So we tried to, we made uh, an experiment with this implant with our hand so the user 
had this implant and uh, uh, the, we made the, the first experiments in uh, for uh, providing stimuli uh, of contact which means uh, trying to provide stimuli and uh, we published a paper I can give you the reference okay, okay. Uh, I think we'll have to stop there. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>